Hello, my name is Alexandria Carrington, and this is a song that I wrote called In the Dark. It's about realizing that you and everyone you know are victims of an oppressive government. It's about listening to the voices that have been silenced and quieted, and finally eradicating the systems that oppress us. I hope this song resonates with you, as, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. Squinted eyelids, waiting ears, and excitement for when they hear what you've done. Just wait till I release the facts. There's a price to pay to keep them in the dark. Quiet footsteps are magnified The wind, soft fingers chill your spine Sunshine, you bring hope into our eyes Through the coldest night Show me you will always rise Hello justice You bring truth into our eyes Under
Thank you, Alexandria Carrington and all the students involved in making that amazing and moving performance of In the Dark. That was a perfect way to set the tone for this event since we are all here connected through music. It is now my honor to introduce and welcome our Artists as Activist panelists, Pussy Riot member Nadia Tolokonikova, Grammy-nominated rapper from Houston, Bun B, and our wonderful moderator, the Recording Academy's Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer, Valicia Butterfield-Jones. Thank you, Alani. Hi, everybody. So good to see you. Bless you, Bun. <laughs> thank you. Sorry. Uh, before we get into it, I first just want to thank every single person involved for making this conversation happen, especially the Booker T. Washington staff and faculty and advisory board for allowing us to have a Grammy career day, um, especially around such an important topic. And so today's topic, as you all know, is artists as activists. And one of the things that inspired me, including Alexandria's performance and remarks just now is just how resilient and how powerful young people are in the movement for justice right now. And so as we get into this important and timely conversation during such an important time in our history in the world, um, I just wanna remind us that students are the future and you all are the present. And so just thank you for leading the way and shining a light on so many injustices that are happening around the world. 2020 brought a lot of crazy shifts, the global pandemic, social and racial um, injustice and unrest happening around the globe. And, and so many of us uh, wanted to lean in and do our part. And so in today's conversation, we're gonna talk about what that role actually means. And Bun and Nadia, I know you both know how powerful music has been in the movement and in all of our lives over the last year, always, but especially over the last year, the power to unify, the power to heal and the power to speak up. And so Nadia, I'd love for you to start with just how's your heart right now uh, with everything that's going on in the world, just checking in first on how you all are both doing. So Nadia, would love for you to kick off. Hi, um, well, I'm half dead right now because it just got COVID. So <laughs> I, I, if I make no sense sometimes, uh, but you know, I'm functional, luckily my body has been really well, but you know, so. Um, yeah, I'm not, I, I think I could, I could do better if I, if I didn't catch COVID. Um, I'm in uh, Ukraine at the moment and they experienced really big spike. Um, so yeah, I was, I was one of, I was one of those who caught it, but, um, well, it was, um, it was an insane year, 2020. Um, and I know that everything bad that that care brought to us didn't um didn't stop in the beginning of 2021 and i know it was from my own experience no but the pandemic is far from being over but i feel like um more things started to uh get into move i would say um, i don't know as it feels like people learn how to live with covid they, be, they learn how to keep working on their projects and it's just like because it takes a lot of time and i feel like when we just started with this whole pandemic situation with um we put so much expectations in us and we thought oh we are going to really learn how to live in this new society in in one month and when we did not we experienced a lot of frustrations uh, towards ourselves and I feel like that's what I was experiencing and my community and um like more I talk with people the more I see uh, that this was like generally the, the, the line that everyone was following. So I feel like uh, in 2021, we finally embraced that the world's not the same. 
Um, and also we have some light in the end of the tunnel, which is a vaccine. And we hope that um, eventually we'll be able to go back to um, our favorite practices like touring and performing at festivals and just, you know, seeing people. Nadia, I just want to say I'm sending you, and I know we all are, love and healing energy. I had COVID too a few months ago, and I know how that feels. So just thank you for being here. Um, we don't for a second take you or it for granted. Just thank you. Bun, how yes. you feeling? How you doing? I'm feeling good. Uh, first of all, hello, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, to all the young students of Brooklyn T. Washington, I'm honored to speak to you guys today. I'm very happy to be joined by Nadia. Nadia is my protest spirit animal. I see so much that she's done and how she not only puts herself on the front line. Um, I think I think people maybe don't understand the difference between protesting in America and protesting in foreign countries. In America, we protest with the possibility of being maybe assaulted or arrested um, because of our views and the stance that we take. When Nadia chooses to protest in Russia, there's probability, like it's almost certain, right? That people will be arrested and be abused and held against their will by the police. So, you know, we take this very seriously when we decide to activate, get out on the front lines and stand up for our fellow people, but it's necessary. I've been watching the trial here. My wife keeps the trial on um, all day, every day. Um, so even when I'm not actively watching it, when I'm doing other stuff, it's still in the background. It's wonderful to see how precise the prosecution has been in presenting this case, not to mention how prepared the witnesses have been for cross-examination. And while I do think the defense is competent, I think the idea of the scene being too tense for the police to get off of George Floyd because of what was happening in the scene. I think it's a flawed defense um, just on itself. I don't think it's going to hold up. And, um, you know, I, I feel so far, V, I feel really good about where it's going, you know. And, I mean, with the city offering the money to the family beforehand, it's already pretty much admitting culpability. So I, we just kind of have to go through the throes of of justice. But I will say I feel so much for the witnesses, um, the young people, the older gentlemen, just everyone in general who are traumatized, not only by watching this man be murdered by the police, right? But then also having to deal with survivors' remorse as they relive this murder, feeling that they should have done more, thinking that, you know, had they done more, he would still be alive. And I just wish someone would tell them, George Floyd didn't die because you didn't do more. George Floyd died because the police didn't do less, you know, but I feel confident that uh, we will get the conviction of Derek Chauvin. And until then, I keep my prayers up for the family and everyone, um, all the witnesses that have to relive this trauma on the stand. Those of us um, who deal with racial trauma, watching the trial, and, you know, being triggered by all these things. I pray for you guys right now. I really do. It's crazy, Bun, because I know like like all of us, I, I'm watching the trial every day like your wife and just asking myself those questions, right? Those introspective questions on what should I be doing? Could I be doing more? You know, I think, you know, all of us play a role. And so I'd love for you both to talk about what that role looks like for any student who's watching, who's saying, you know, I'm upset, I'm hurt, I'm angry. Maybe, you know, I feel like there's more I should be doing but what is my role in all of this? How did you both find your voice or how did you know, Nadia, you know, the role that you wanted to play in such a critical movement? Um, I feel it's always important to follow your instincts and uh, do something that you enjoy to do naturally. It's a problem of a lot of activists that they want to do someone else who they love and adore and they come from their point of admiration and it's, um, it's truly awesome to admire someone that you shouldn't compare yourself to other people and this, this is one of the biggest problems in um, in modern life I think like we're exposed to um, so many different um, lives around that I mean like if you think about it and if you just read books about, books about early hunter-gatherer societies people were exposed to 15 to, to uh, 
100 people around them so they couldn't compare and be an envy so much as these days so sometimes you know even when you compare yourself with someone with the best uh intentions like being like oh my god i love aoc i want to be like aoc but um well i know that i can't because i'm an introvert and she's an extrovert and that's 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 just to, to begin with right um so i feel like it's important to learn about yourself and um what do you feel comfortable doing and what what makes you thrive and uh what makes you fuller as a human being and uh, it might be it might be art um it might not even like uh, maybe we'll even have to embrace that it's not connected with going out to the streets and it's fine too um i'm really glad that this conversation um has started right now in russia um many young feminists they're making their vlog uh statements about um you know addressing those people who feel uh who feel like they're too insecure to go to the streets right now because um as ban said it's it's really really extremely dangerous in russia right now if you go to the street you can um um you maybe you're just uh, going to be standing in front of the policeman but they will lie in your face in the court and they will drag you to the court and they'll tell that you hit them and this this is what was happening especially if you're a known as political activist this was happening with my friends um Masha Lekin and Lisa Stein who are facing two years in jail right now just because they tweeted and they posted stories about protests um they um they're a queer couple and they're serving well they are under house arrest currently but uh, they're facing two years in jail so um yeah um i i don't think anyone should break themselves like one one thing is to push your boundaries another thing is to um to commit to some uncomfortable acts for yourself so yeah i'm i'm really happy that this topic was addressed by many young feminists in russia who are saying like you know like remember when it's um uh, remember like this is important to care about your mental health and be sure that you're something like whatever you're doing is um ecological consistent um and um sustainable for you and for, for your mental health and, and and the community around you so for me this kind of uh, practice was art mm. and um i was asking myself if i want to go to um to policy um and that was um there was an interesting path and i think it um uh, you definitely should go for it if you if you feel like you can you can do it but i was like oh i just I, i'm not done for you know communicating with a lot of random people and you know explaining myself a lot i just like i like to make a gesture to make a um, uh, aesthetical statement and um and then let people work on inter- interpretations of it um i don't like to explicitly talk about everything that it is you know every image or every image of the future that comes to my head so in that sense i was like yeah i'm going to be shitty politician and we have a lot of shitty politicians anyway so we're going to need to add one more um and this how it came to art um and uh, we've been doing this performance art since 2007 and um i personally was always interested in um um the intersection between politics and art because um I was growing up really really seriously loving avant-garde uh, of the beginning of the 20th century in Russia and I was thinking that if one day Russia is going to um occupy or dominate it has to dominate with art not with tanks or arms like I'm fine when you know you um when when, when you establish your power is through um something intellectual or artistic because it's not it's not power that damages it's power that um helps you to start a dialogue and then other people can um chime in and in the end the story it's not a war it's it's just a peaceful conversation so i was always uh, for putin instead of using tanks and arms and you know um I, I'm, I, basically prosec- prosecuting his political opponents i always wanted him to support art and philosophy and science and i felt like that would be so much better way for him to use his incredible money and power that he happened to have but um you know he followed completely different paths and i think it's just so not 
just it's just not smart and uh, it actually makes me really sad to see a lot of western people to attribute um qualities um to put in that he i believe doesn't have like i don't think he's smart because if he was smart and he was truly powerful then he would um then he would support really sustainable and long-term things like science art and philosophy thank you so much nadia i i'm learning and listening um, carefully to so many of the gems that you dropped. And the three things that I took away that hopefully the students listening took away too were one, follow your instincts. And I think so often we just wanna force, you know, our role in, in so many things when we're not truly listening to our heart. So thank you for that. Um, the second was you shouldn't con- compare yourself to other people. That was powerful for me. Um, and then the last, which may have been the most important is for us to take care of our mental health. Right. And so, so many of us, I think, uh, ignore the signs when maybe we we're feeling something and, and we may need to get, you know, additional support. So if anyone is feeling like they're not taking care of their mental health, please listen to Nadia and take that next step to make sure that you are. So Bun, yes. when you and I first met, you were on the front lines as an activist and an artist, and that was 15 years ago. So where did it begin for you? I don't know the answer, Um, although we've known each other for so long, but when did you find your voice? Because I think so often, you know, society may, or even the industry may want to put artists in a box and say, well, you need to say this thing, yeah. Yeah, no, I think for me, um, I think um, it has to have been around the time of James Byrd. Mm-hmm. Right. The, the James Bird dragging incident. One, because it was just v- so close to home. Right. Like I lived, you know, 30 miles away from where this happened to this gentleman. And I don't think people realize how many of these very small pockets of racism exist in America. So I'm from Port Arthur, Texas. Right. Um, we have a town next to us. It's called Bridge City because basically you have to cross a bridge to get into the city. Right. And today 2021, I'm, uh, well, for example, I graduated in 92. I still live in the area up until the early 2000s. And as, as recently as at least 2012, there were no minorities in this town, right? And we hear about the Viters and Stone Mountains and all of these kind of things, but there are still very small pockets of America that have implemented racism as a lifestyle, isolated progressive-minded people and people that are different from them and have created this very small bubble that they can allow themselves to live in, right? That doesn't, that isn't permeated by culture or art or science or music. They get to keep their very small-minded views and live the life in a world of people that look like them, talk like them and act like them, right? And there's no outside influence and so these people are stunted in growth. I mean, I, I go to the town of, of Vider, like I drive through the city of Vider. You have to go through Vider in order to get from Houston to Louisiana. And you look and there's still like, like all of their grocery stores are old. All of their shopping centers are old, right? Because of the fact that they wanna live in this, in this time period that really doesn't exist anymore, right? A world that isn't diverse doesn't exist anymore. A world that isn't inclusive doesn't exist anymore. And you can fight it as long as you feel it necessary, but it's going to happen whether you like it or not. But to the young people, when we talk about like activism and how do you find your way in, um, I think, you know, for most of us, when we think, you know, activism, we think marches and rallies, right? And so everyone, you know, is like, well, I want to help. But let's say for Let's look at George Floyd, for example, right? Many people, you know, were outraged by the murder of George Floyd, right? And wanted to do something. But we were in the middle of a pandemic and people didn't feel comfortable necessarily marching in the streets. And so I tell people, look, um, activism has many hats that people have to wear, right? So there are marchers, there are protesters, right? But we also need people to organize the rally, right? We need people to promote the rally, right? We need people to get permits for the rally, right? We need lawyers on standby when protesters get arrested to get them released from jail as soon as possible. You know, we need people handing out water. There's so many different roles 
that you can play, you know, and I would say find a place that you feel comfortable, right? As Nadia said, use your instincts, right? You know what your strengths are, right? If you're an artist, paint a mural. If you're a singer, write a song. If you're a musician, play music. Str struggles always need soundtracks, you know? I think back to Mahalia Jackson singing before Dr. King, you know? There's always been music, a musical component, component or some level of artistic component to protesting and activism in America. Uh, but there's a place for everybody. Simply caring is good enough, right? Being able to, you know, talk about these things in public, having difficult conversations around the Thanksgiving dinner, all of these things are necessary. And because the problem is, is that we've been so quiet and so complacent for so long, right? You know, people of color had entry into the suburbs and better jobs and better opportunities. And, you know, some of them were able to actually build some level of equity and give their children PlayStations and buy them Gucci shoes and dress them up very nice for Easter and all of these different things, right? But it's still not enough, right? It's still, you still have to go back and remember that for every one person that makes it through the struggle, right? There are tens of thousands left behind. You know, and, and I want to say one thing, too, because I hear I hear things framed differently. So when we look at this picture behind me and I'm not sure how, how deep you can see, but it's a picture of Joyce Floyd and it's a picture of other victims of murder. I think we tend to say that George Floyd died from police brutality far too much. You don't die from police brutality. You live with police brutality. You die from murder by police. And so all of these names that you see, Tamir, Philando, and Sandra, and all the other, you know, victims of murder by police, we need to reframe this narrative, right? Because people can survive police brutality, but people don't survive murder by police. That is so true, uh, Bun. I think language matters most, right, in how we tell the story um, for not just us, but for future generations, like the context of what happened to George Floyd, the context of what happened to Tamir Rice, and so many um, people um, that, that were murdered. Um, so you all both laid out some of the roles of activism and what it could look like as a politician, an artist, an educator or a teacher, uh, organizer, lawyer, all critical roles, even a person who may be an executive or working within a corporation to change that corporation or giving money um, to organizations that are on the front lines. But how do you know, regardless of what role you play, that you've made an impact? Like, have each of you had that moment in your journey that you say, okay, the, the work that I'm doing is making a difference? Nadia, I saw you shake your head. <laughs> um, I feel like there is no, there's no such a moment. You just, mm -hmm. I'm, I really love what Bernie Sanders says about this thing. You just, you just need to do it because you feel like it's the right thing to do. And that's it, you don't have to measure it. And I feel like so many activists, especially when you step into the field, and this is like not to blame them as it's natural. We live in a capitalist society and we, are, we we know that when we give something, we should get something immediately back. But that's not how it works. And activism is just um, a little bit different because the work was really dif difficult social fabric um, that involves so many interests and there's so many languages, nations, and everything is so interconnected. So there is no way even political scientists will like for, for real know what's going to happen. So I feel like um, what you can do is just, um, you know, like act according to your set of um, ethical rules and just feel good about it. What about you, Bon? What do you think? Well, I think, and it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question, right? Um, here's the reality in terms of America, right? So the battle against racism has existed for hundreds of years. The reality is that millions of people lost their lives to fight for civil rights, to fight against slavery, Jim Crow, all of these different things in the effort to combat slavery, racism, and oppression of black people. Unfortunately, almost all of them died not seeing change in their time. Right. The reality is, is that most of them did it knowing that. Right. Our ancestors sacrificed knowing that they would not see 
change in their time, but died with the hope that, that the generations that came after them would see it. And it's, it's gotten better, but we've still not where we're trying to go. But had those before us not sacrificed, we wouldn't be where we are now. They sacrificed for us. They bled for us. They sweat for us. They died for us. And some of us in this generation have to be willing to put ourselves on the front line. Not all of us, but maybe one of you listening to me today will have it inside of you to sacrifice something for the betterment of your people, of your family. Some of you may have little brothers and sisters, right? And you don't want them to grow up dealing with racism. You don't want to worry about whenever they get their driver's license and they get pulled over in a car, will they get harassed by the police, assaulted by the police, potentially killed by the police. So in order for us to get where we're trying to go as a collective, as a people, yes, some of us have to be willing to, as they say, bite the bullet and put their lives on the line. I would not want my son to have to do it and my grandkids to have to do it. So I'm willing to do it now. And I would love for it to end with my generation. But if it doesn't, I hope that I leave my children and grandchildren an example to follow so that in their times, when they're here with crises, I remember my son in, in the midst of this George Floyd situation, realizing that he was the parent of, my son has black children, my son has Mexican children, my son has mixed race children. And so it, it really hit him, you know, like a bat that his children could be harassed, assaulted, imprisoned, or even murdered just for not being white. And so, you know, and I, so I, I feel his pain. I, I see, you know, how it hurts him to think that his children could live in a world like that. This is the same pain that we had when he started driving. And I'm sure the same pain that my parents experienced or uh, concern that they experienced when I started driving. So yeah, if, if I could end racism today with my life, boom, we're done. I'm out of here. Peace out. It's not even a question, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's going to take more than one person. It's going to take a lot of us. But everything starts with one person. Um, and I hope that one of you listening today will take up that charge. Yeah, I also wanted to add, um, when you live by these rules, when you fight for a better world right now, and when, when, you, um, when you do it for yourself and your community today, you already live in the in, in a better world. It's not linear. It's not like it's going to happen necessarily in the next generation. It's like, even if it doesn't translate right now to the whole society, you create this beautiful community around you and you enjoy um, fruits of your activist labor right here and right now. And, and, and that's why I really love my community. And there are those who give me uh, most of the power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's about the perpetuation of hope, right? It's about collectively believing that we're by doing the right thing, eventually the world corrects itself. And that itself is uplifting internally, right? As a mom of two young black sons, I was just gonna say, um, your words both struck me. Um, one, Nadia, you saying, you don't have to measure it. And I think so often, you know, as we begin to see corporations invest in the movement and organizations invest in the movement, they wanna see, a return. They want to know that the work we're doing is working. And, and Nadia, it was just so freeing to hear you say that we don't have to measure it. And Bun, you say like, we've got to hold our end of the timeline, right? During our time here on earth, we've got to do our part and then let the next generation come and carry it forward. So just thank you both for that. So it is time for us to get into some student questions. If you all have a few minutes um, and I'd love for Gloria to join us to kick us off for the first question. She is a student at Booker T. Hi, Gloria. Hi, um, my question, I just wanted to say it's an honor to be here and to be speaking to you guys. But um, my first question is, do you have any advice for young musicians of color trying to navigate their way through a white male dominated industry? And how do you think the new generation of artists can make music more accessible to people of color? That's amazing. I think the first thing is to find like-minded people, right? You guys have the beauty of social media at your disposal. So it's a lot easier to connect yourself with like-minded people, right? Um, no one makes it alone, right? So you're going to have to, you know, have someone there as a support system. 
Um, but I think the most important thing is just educating yourself about what you're getting into, right? The whole idea of being, in, of, of existing and progressing and, you know, actually winning in the entertainment industry is about being educated about the business of the music industry. Because that's where, honestly, the majority of the oppression will come from, right? The fact of, and it's not, it's not simply just a color thing, right? Like record companies take advantage of all artists who don't protect themselves in terms of understanding contractual law or having attorneys and management around them that understand the nuances of the music industry. But just follow your heart, make the music that you believe, let your music be a representation of you and your worldview and how you feel, right? So that when you walk in the room, people already know who they're dealing with, right? And if they don't want to accept you, that's fine. But I guarantee you, when you speak your truth through your music, people will seek you out. I was just, um, I was a host yesterday on Swing in the Morning. And while I, I was the next guest, but while I was on hold, they were doing like a, a contest with artists, right? It's called um, Put Them in a Game or Keep Them on the Bench. And there was a young man on there and he had literally just survived like a horrifying car crash, left him with a TBI, which is a traumatic brain injury. Um, while he was you know, rehabbing himself, his father passed away. And the only way for him to kind of, you know, deal with the pain of, of what he was going through was through his music. As a musician, you have a beautiful opportunity to express yourself, whether it's good or bad. You have an outlet to deal with the things that maybe you don't truly understand or can't really come to terms with or get a grasp of. Please use that. You know, use your music for that. Speak your truth. If, and talk about these things, right? When you feel a certain way, like, you know, people get on Instagram and want to go live when they get a new outfit or a purse or shoes or something. I, when I go on Instagram, I talk about concerns. I talk about how I feel, right? I let the world know where I stand on certain things. And by doing that, I mark my space in this world, but I also attract people who feel like I feel and think like I think to me. Right. So there's always strength in numbers. So as a young artist, I would definitely say network with people, get to know people, find people who feel like you, create art with people who feel like you. Right. Um, make music with people, write songs with people, but but live life. Right. Because you're going to be in the real world a lot more than you're going to be a musician. Right. So find people who share your worldview and live your life to the fullest. And yeah, there are gonna be people that won't accept you, that won't embrace you and may try to hinder you. That does not have anything to do with what God has chosen for you. No one can stop you if it's meant to be. Just don't give up on yourself. Thank you so much. <laughs> no problem, good, good luck. luck. Thank you. Good luck. Okay, Jackie, they are next. It's such an honor to like even get to interact with y'all. Um, I'm such a big fan of both Bunby and Nadia. Um, my question for y'all was, oh gosh, I read it, I read it down, hold on. <laughs> um, You're fine. Uh, this is probably a more specific question for Nadia, but how do you deal with misogyny and political biases in the music industry? I, I know that you're very vocal about your political views and where you stand on social issues and I could see that some people might not want to work or with you, or maybe men kind of come in the way of your voice being heard in the music industry, if that's true or not for you. Um, but how would you deal with that? Ooh. <laughs> so um, that's a big question. That's a big question and I love it. Um, thank you so much for asking it. Um, well, when it comes to Pussy Red, we, um, everything that we do is inherently political. And I don't think you can find a lot of artists like that. And I'm not really taking pride in that. It's just like how we started to behave from the very beginning. So right now, sometimes, even if I would want to write about something else, like about sun or Friday party, or I don't know, like about love, I would not be able uh, because that's how we started. That's how we, that's what we promise to the world. So everything we do is inherently political. And uh, it's not the most comfortable thing in the world. Uh, so when I deal with the music industry, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not linear, it's not easy, but I would say that 
um, personal connections always go further and they always go better than connections with um, corporations. And so I can just echo uh, Bond's advice on connecting with people and networking. So that really always helped us and pushed us forward um, always, like always. Um, and you know, and it, but also people always see if you talk to them just because you want to get something from them. So um, I feel I feel like being an activist musician is a really great place to be if you know how to navigate around it. So so many people are going to be willing to help your cause, and you will be um, you will be surprised and and you know in. Um, shocked sometimes by the amount of people who want to help you. But when you will come to talk to corporations like labels or distributors, um, you should not be surprised that they're, they're not going to be willing to work with you. And, you know, on a deeper uh, business level, I can understand them. In the beginning, I was like, I was just pissed. I was mm, I was not understanding that, but I but now I do, um, and it's not like I'm justifying their behavior, but I do understand because they could have just purely economic incentives and, and things that they do, and you can truly earn, um, like, you know, say, um, you know, how to say it, sustainable, you can't have sustainable money stream with political art. You can, you can have one, um, you can have one hit, uh, but then the next thing will be more controversial and it will take away from the hate. Uh, anyway, so this is this is not a money um, a money earner activist art. This is not. But um, but again, you can find other ways how to fund your art. Um, I've never been signed to any label. Never. Um, nobody from Pussy Riot has been signed to a label. And I don't think I'm looking forward to it um, and unless... I'll find a really good allies at the label that they will be willing to give us all the creative freedoms and really be backing us and believing in us 100%. I haven't seen it anywhere yet. So I prefer to just act by myself. And recently we just uh, stepped into the NFT market and it was really great for us. Uh, we sold four NFTs for 170s for East, which equals... 370 um thousand yeah three hundred seventy thousand dollars which is like you can see i i didn't think i didn't really know how to operate with these numbers but so we split it between the creatives behind the project and a part of the money we sent to uh shelter for victims of domestic violence and part of the money we saved for uh for this fund of creating our future activist art projects so um, we were like, and, and you know, the, the money, even after all the splits, the money that we got just from this one single sale of our NFT art was bigger than any of the record labels have has ever offered us. So it's not, I'm saying it's not to discourage people from working with labels at that it works for many artists and, and, and really and boost their career. But um, I had similar conversations with um, arch activist artists like, they're in Electra and um, they feel the same. Um, they're quick queer pop artists um, and they are completely independent. They don't have the management or um, you know formal distribution deal. They've never been part of any label and they're just navigating the whole um, the whole world by their by their own. Um, I guess with the power of connecting to people as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that great question. Thank you, Mavi. Hey, Alex is next. Hey, Alex. Hi, it's so good to see everyone. Thank you so much for talking to us today. I'm so, so excited. Um, so my question is for both of you. Um, so what drew you guys to activism through your art and music? And what are some of the biggest challenges that you wish people knew about? Um, well, for me in hip hop, right? I had a lot of people who kind of set the stage for that, right? Who use their platform and their voices to amplify concerns of different various communities, right? So in New York, we had public enemy, right? Who were very controversial about um, police brutality, uh, racial oppression and attacks and different things of that nature. 
on the West Coast, a lot of the people in Oakland, which is where the Black Panthers originally formed, right? So many of the recording artists in Oakland are either children of Panthers or relatives of Panthers, but grew up with that aesthetic around them. So people like Paris, groups like the Coup were always very active in their communities, specifically in, uh, in relation to the police and their, um, their way of policing their communities. Um, but for me, I, you know, once I realized that things were happening in my specific community, right? And I knew that the people who followed me and were, you know, listened to my music and agreed with my worldview would be offended by these things. Once I used my voice to amplify different accents and situations and issues of concern for various communities, people were enraged about that kind of stuff. Sometimes people century simply don't have enough information for them to engage. I know for myself, I don't want to get involved in anything unless I know everything about it, right? Because I don't want to jump into anything half-heartedly. I don't want to jump into anything where I'm not fully informed, right? I want to be able to speak to the cause and the concern at hand, not in general, right? I want to be able to speak to specificities about what people need and what people don't need. And, you know, and it's not easy. I'll be honest. It's not easy. You know, you have to have a very strong stomach, right? Because some of these things are like physically um, repulsive, right? When you see police jump on unarmed women, right? And, uh, you know, police beat up people who are already um, uh, handcuffed, right? And have been subdued. And it's, it's, you know, the pepper spray and the rubber bullets and all of these different things that we see when these things happen, they're not easy to deal with alone, you know? And so, yeah, no, I would, I would definitely say that anyone that wanted to go into something, if you decide you want to go and protest, bring a partner. Don't protest by yourself. Never do any of these things by yourself because it's very easy for them to, when things happen, right? When pepper spray and smoke bombs and grenades start to shoot off, people tend to scatter and run. And you could find yourself by yourself um, across from the opposition. It's, it can be very dangerous you know, in America, and even more so in Nadia's case, but it's necessary. It's really necessary. One day you're going to see something and you're going to be like, okay, this is terrible. And I just don't want to stand back and not do anything. So what can I do? You'll find your path. You'll find a way to speak your truth about it. And the world would be better because you did. Thank you for that question, Alex. So let's bring uh, Neha to the stage. She will take Hello. Firstly, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. It's been really inspiring to hear what you guys have to say about activism. So thank you so much. So my question is, um, within the music industry, how do you navigate problems such as elitism and nepotism and other problems that exist within the industry itself? And what advice do you have for musicians on how to deal with those problems? Nadia, do you want to um, speak to this one? You want me to start? Um, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I feel like I'm not really like um, I'm not really want, I shouldn't be responsible really for us um, answering this question because we started as conceptual artists and we stepped into music industry from performance art and conceptual art. So. We always, it all, it like, you know, when we were, we were growing up and becoming adults and, like, you know, thinking about our role in lives and our strategies, um, we were thinking about us as, um, as conceptual artists, not as musicians. So I feel like when we stepped into music industry later, around 2015, um, it was easier because we already were. Well, I was 26 at the time. I had prison behind my back. <laughs> I had um, I had some media that were willing to write about Pussy Riot and, you know, allies and in, um, in artists in in the art world. So I felt um, liberated from the constraints that music industry traditionally puts on the artists. So I feel like I didn't experience that much troubles as. Um, as a new artist who comes into um, into this space, but what I encountered um, is definitely conservatism that is based on, as I said before, economic 
um, reasoning that lies behind uh, most of like most of the decisions, like, truly most of the decisions that executives make in music industry. And um, well, I've, I never interacted with labels by myself, but I've heard that there are amazing people who truly believe in art and just like want to help people to uh, fulfill their potential and that that's what uh, drives them. But um, you know, like I'm honestly never, <laughs> never seen that uh, in um, big league music industries, um, and so I'd say it really suffers from um, capitalism and for profit incentives. And you know, like when you have to create uh, art for profit, that's you know you you have a chance to create good art uh, because you know so some of the really great artists of our times and past times, they've been selling good, but you know, you can't measure art only by by the merit of like how how good it sales. So I'd say for me it was the biggest problem and and nepotism and elitism it always come come from that. Because um I feel like <laughs> I feel like for profit industry, they're switching really quickly to new trends. And so like if today's trendy to support artists and throw money into artists who just were released from jail that's what they will do and if tomorrow it's another marginalized community they will throw money at you but it's not sustainable you know they will turn their backs on you tomorrow when it's not trendy anymore thank you i love that i love how she just spoke to that um so we have to frame elitism and nepotism not just as concept within the entertainment industry, but in business, as you know, of all business, you know, as Nadia said, it's it's really built around capitalism, right? So these are concepts that are based around the notion that only a certain few people deserve to be able to prosper in this country. Only a few people deserve to be able to live a certain quality of life and have certain things afforded to them, right? And so a lot of business, right? Not just the entertainment business, it's built around the perpetuation of these notions. So it doesn't really matter if you decide to be a musician, whatever you decide to do for a living in this world will have elements of capitalism, elitism and nepotism there. The truth is it's usually the minority, right? Most people can prosper in this world to a certain extent. It's really only when you start wanting to deal in ownership is when it becomes a problem. As long as you're willing to be a part of the workforce, Elitism and nepotism typically won't interfere with you until it comes time for, for promotions, moving, moving up to management, um, and, and onto board positions, higher executive positions within the company. That's where you'll start to see elitism and nepotism come in. One, because the pay is higher, but two, um, you become more privy to the inner workings of the company, particularly the financial aspects, and you'll you'll tend to realize what's going on. If you're not in on it, they're not going to let you in it, right? Like I'm an entertainer. So I, I, I go out to LA and, and you'll see like a party and there's a room where everybody's in. And then there's a room where a few people in and then there's like this one back bedroom that only like four people are in, right? And you don't get into that room unless you're down with what's already happening in that room, right? You don't get to even be privy to it. Um, but I wouldn't I, I would say do not let the idea or the concepts of elitism and nepotism discourage you in any way. Right. And, and Nadia made a great point. Your your art, your artistic contribution to this world should not be gauged by how many records you sell, how many people come to your concerts and how many people are walking around in your T-shirts. Right. It's about how many people believe what you believe and put those things into action. That's really the true test of artistic contribution in the society. So please make the music you want to make, create the art you want to create, give yourself to the world. And one day someone will come up to you and it only really takes one person to come up to you and say, thank you. Right. And, and that'll make everything you've gone through worthwhile. I promise you. Great advice. Thank you, Neha. Um, Nadia, before you head out, is there a final word or anything you'd like to share with the students? Um, yeah, as I'm speaking with the students, I would like to address um, a younger version of myself. Well, I'm 31, so um, 
Uh, but let's say I would want like, mm, let me address 18 years old version of myself or even 17. Okay, so when you are 17, uh, you see a lot of ageism. Um, when you are a 17 years old girl, you're seeing a lot of ageism mixed with sexism, which makes things completely unbearable for you, um, which makes completely impossible for you to believe in your dream to true, like almost impossible for you to believe in your dream and just focus on it because everyone has... Um, a right for whatever reason to say that um, uh, your dreams are insane, that you're never going to achieve it. And that's what I had. Um, maybe you're not. And, and you know, people around me, they were thinking that they're coming from, um, you know, the best motivation because they were like, oh, we have to be realistic. Um, you probably have to be a lawyer or maybe an economist. It's not sustainable. It's not cool. It's not, it's like, I mean, it's not, it's not like safe right uh to be an artist but um i did believe in myself and um i think i was just a really i, I was the child who who were thriving on resisting but not everyone has to be like that and i acknowledge the fact that there are a lot of people who would um who would follow this discouraging advices um so if you if you ever see yourself in this situation please please don't uh because um um, and then if I could, if I could, if I could talk to myself, um, 17 years old version of myself, and I would tell myself to be even more uh, confident in dreams that I have, because I know right now for a fact that it was possible to achieve them and even more. Um, I think I overachieved them like five times. I am here just to echo her, I guess, like just there dare to dream and dare to think about a different world that is possible and and bring it closer i'm still doing it and i keep i'm keeping this inner child inside me thank you so much nadia for joining us we honor you we respect you um and we're rooting for you in all that you do um when did you want to give nadia final goodbye absolutely nadia i'm not sure if you really realize how inspiring you are yeah. There are people all around the world who, although they may never ever come in contact with you or be able to tell you, they are inspired by you, they are encouraged by you, they are emboldened by you, and you are affecting change in the world in ways you may never even know. And so I think that's a great message to these kids that if you get out there and you live your truth and you follow your heart, you will change the world. You may not even know that you're changing the world, but it's changing. People's lives are being changed by everything that we do collectively and individually. Nadia, I salute you. Um, I, I mean, seriously, you are literally fighting the good fight. I, I wish that I could be there with you because some of those dudes could, could, you could use a man's touch, so to speak. It just excites <laughs> me to see how, how they, they try to treat you guys, but thank God that you have the spirit and the conviction to keep going. We are rooting for you. We are praying for you. For quick, you know, we want you to quickly return to good health and get out there and continue to fight the good fight. I am your soldier in arms. Please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, but if you don't mind me asking, I don't know if we talk about it uh, publicly. Where are you based? I'm in Houston, Houston, Texas. Everybody knows okay. that's no, no secret. I I'm don't really, have to keep I'm my really location. Um, I'd love to see one day. Well, I'm really often in LA, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of far from Houston. I mean, but if you're yeah, ever in LA, I, let me know. <laughs> I, oh, yeah, we go to LA pretty often. So if you're in the States, uh, please make contact. You're inspirational as well. I'm really happy about this panel. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you. Hey, Bun, if you're yeah. okay with it, we're going to get in one or two more questions. Yeah, I got a minute. I, I can hang so too. Okay, cool. Sophia, she is next. Hi, Sophia. Hi. Um, thanks for Hi. talking to us. Sorry. Um, okay, so my question was, what is the connection between what you aspire to achieve and what your art slash activism has accomplished so far? Well, it's really all about effort, right? There are so many things in life that we're going to want to do and try to accomplish 
that may never happen, right? But we learn so many lessons along the way, right? You hear people say, it's not the destination, it's the journey. And that's true. Sometimes you can work so hard to put in a, you know, a ton of effort to get somewhere and then realize it's not even really where you want to be, you know? And you have to be prepared for that as well. I know a lot of people who wanted to be entertainers, wanted to be famous. And then as soon as it did, they realized that it, it, it took every bit of privacy from them. They had no idea how, how little they valued having time to themselves. And then they start to resent everything that they had, you know? Um, this is not an easy thing to do. And many people do it coming out feeling somewhat unfulfilled, right? But that's gonna happen no matter what your path in life is, right? Many people try, some people do, some don't, right? And we have to make peace with all of that, right? If you try to, to get somewhere in life and you don't make it there, that doesn't mean that you didn't try hard enough. I'm a recording artist, right? So I, one out of probably every 10,000 people that record music actually have someone purchase it, right? Maybe out of those 10,000, maybe one of 100, one, uh, maybe one out of 100 people will actually have songs that play on the radio. One out of 10 of us will tour around the country and around the world on stages. And maybe only the top 1% of us will become superstars, right? But it's not for lack of effort. It's not for lack of talent. It's not for lack of appreciation. Sometimes these things just simply don't come together. Many people that I saw in my time as an entertainer, I felt were more talented than me, right? But some of them didn't have the drive. Some of them didn't really have the passion. You know, some of them just didn't really take it serious enough. What, what is it that you want to be? What do you want to be? Like, how do you, and how do you see yourself changing the world? Let me ask you a question. Um, well, I want to be a nurse practitioner. And I just, yeah, I like taking care of people and helping people. I also play the violin. So I like playing chamber music as well. That would be amazing to have someone to come in and not only give care to people, but then come in with the gift of music and even soothe them at some of their most trying times. You're in a very unique position to help people. You know, you're going to be there in, in their lowest, weakest moments to, to give them hope, right? To, to help them get through that time, right? Your music will give them peace of mind. You're going to be an amazing person in this world. You have so much to contribute. You know what I'm saying? I can't, I can't wait. Hopefully I don't meet you in the hospital, right? Maybe I can catch you performing in some concerto somewhere. But look, man, it, life is about trying, right? You're going to try to accomplish more than you will accomplish. But you're going to learn more from trying than you will from accomplishing. Keep that in mind. Thank you. All right, Bun, as we close out, uh, what final words do you have for the students who are here today watching? I entrust you guys with the world. I know you are capable enough. I know you are smart enough. I know you care enough. I know you have the passion and you have the concern. All you guys are waiting for is purpose. Mm -hmm. I really hope that sooner than later, you all find your true purpose in life, that you're able to chase that purpose, Right. And even if you don't get to where you think you're supposed to be, you'll be more than surprised at where you end up. I had my life planned out as to who I would be at this age. And thank God that, you know, I wasn't limited by that because I had a very limited view of what I was capable of doing and who I was able to of who I was capable of becoming. Never limit yourself. Try everything except drugs. Right. But. <laughs> In terms of, of chances, right, and opportunities and chasing your dream, throw it all up against the wall. Throw every single thing you want to create, you want to do, and, and, and ideas of who you want to be, throw it all up against the wall. You don't, you, you'd be surprised at what might stick. You know, I started out as a musician. People asked me to, hey, Bun, would you like to come and speak on a panel? Yeah, now I'm, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of my time in speaking engagements, you know, encouraging people in, in various walks of life. You know, um, I took a lot of chances that many people from my community, from where I grew up at, you know, didn't feel comfortable or safe taking, right? They were very happy staying in their place, um, 
you know, working their, you know, jobs. And that's cool. If you're comfortable, there's nothing wrong with being in the working class. There's nothing wrong with being a middle class citizen, right? But if there's something that you want to do, like you really feel in your heart, you want to try, do it. I insist. I am adamant. Do it. You do not want to wake up 20 or 30 years. It, you know, it's crazy that you see people that 45, 50 years old and you hear them sing and you're like, wow, I didn't know you could sing like that. And they probably did want to be a singer at some point in their life. Right. But they just for some reason, they didn't either. They didn't believe in themselves or they didn't have anybody that believed in them and encouraged them. If anyone here watching this Zoom doesn't have someone to tell them that, let me be the first to tell you, you are capable. You are smart enough. You care enough. You have the passion. Find your purpose in life. Go after it unabashedly, right? Chase it with everything you've got. Live your life to the fullest. Take every opportunity afforded to you to progress in life, better your community, and contribute to society as you can. We all want to end up somewhere. But for some of us, life may be meant for us to go farther than that. Be open to it. I encourage you. I lift you. I empower you. I pray for you. And I thank you guys so much for tuning in today. All right. Um, but I want to thank you uh, for living in your truth, living in your purpose, and speaking up for all of us um, the way you do uh, every day um, and every time I see you anywhere in any room, whether that's online or in person, you truly speak truth to power. And so I don't know if you truly know the impact that you've made, not only in Texas, but around the globe, what you have. And I just wanna say thank you for all that you do and just know that we're here with you too. Um, in closing, special thanks um, to the Texas Chapters Education Committee and Booker T. Washington High School's Advisory Board for co-hosting this event. Thank you to Alexandria Carrington for sharing In the Dark. It was a beautiful, beautiful song and you're an even more beautiful person. So we can't wait for all the greatness that we know is to come um, in your journey. Um, and thanks to all of you, the Booker T. Washington students who asked the great que questions throughout today's panel. Uh, shout out to Nadia, shout out to Bun, um, and just thank you um, for taking the time um, during this busy, busy, crazy day um, to host this important conversation, Bun. Thank you, everybody.